Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're going to review one of the most mythological fragrances, in my humble opinion, from the house of Guerlain. And that would be Maora or Mahora, depending on uh, how you want to call it, or later became Mayotte. But uh, Maora is a 2000 release. Um, Interesting, Peter Granai, or Peter Granai, is the designer, the sculptor, the artist who designed this bottle. And uh, the perfume was released in the year 2000 as an eau de parfum, and there was also an extrait, and it was, well, a flop. It didn't sell. It uh, basically was kind of taken off the market a year or two after its release, and then it was reintroduced in their more exclusive range, with a different name, slightly tweaked. And uh, as of now, I think Mayotte is also no longer available uh, in the house of Guerlain. But like most Guerlain fragrances from the kind of late 60s, 70s, up until today, when a perfume is way ahead of its time, it flops. And... Nahima or Nahema uh, was also a flop when it was first released. Later on, considered to be, you know, a groundbreaking new way of utilizing rose later on throughout the years. But, you know, Nahima or Nahema or however you want to pronounce it, uh, made basically after its release and after its flop, Guerlain had to re-envision the entire relaunch, the entire launching of new perfumes, it wasn't any more just artistically based, but there was a whole marketing team brought in to direct exactly how a perfume is going to be made, what the concept is. In other words, after that flop, Guerlain was shook and they were a bit worried for their survival. And so they had to kind of be tamed. The artistic freedoms had to be tamed. And uh, several flops after that. Finally, the last attempt was Samsara in the late 80s. And Samsara was a huge success. Um, Samsara also warranted the interest of LVMH towards Guerlain, which then in the 90s they purchased. So then more things happen, perfumers come and go, and one of the last perfumes created by Mr. Guerlain himself, and this is um, Jean-Paul Guerlain, was Maura. And in the back, you can see in that gold and metal inscription in the back on the metal, it does say Mahora. Now, he was a very old man when he created this perfume. And not for nothing, we are in the middle of the desert. There's a reason for this. There's a reason for this gorgeous landscape that uh, I've prompted my AI bubbles to create. Sorry, just had to fix the mic. Um, and we're going to spray it on. Now, first, subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Deco Ball spelled together there as well for extra perks. Thank you to my members and patrons who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week on my main Super Jacob channel. Come join me there for all the live chats. And uh, so this is this is the deal. <laughs> Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. This bottle is very fascinating. It is supposed to be a seed of sorts. And this is the seed. So you have to envision the bottle. First, we, we look at it just like this. First comes this seed that is kind of sewn together at the tops. And it's a seed that somehow manages to grow in the desert, you see. Now, once the seed falls onto this arid, lifeless, endless land landscape of nothing, of absence of life, somehow, as if by magic, this seed turns 
and unlocks itself. That's where the sprayer is. This is how you unlock the sprayer. So the seed turns, opens up, and magically the roots start growing out of the seed. Not upwards, not outwards from the desert into the sky, but they're actually growing downwards. These are roots. But it's also a plant. Well, they're technically they're just roots for now. The plant is symbolically envisioned once you spray the perfume on, goes up into the air. That's the plant. We're giving life, in other words, to this arid desert. It's a very, very complex sprayer, and uh, it doesn't work very well. Another one of the reasons why <laughs> this perfume maybe was not the hugest success that it could have been, it's because once you unlock it and you kind of spray, it doesn't really work very well. So we might leak a little bit, unfortunately, but I'm going to try to do my best. Wait, hold on, let me take my ring off so I don't scratch the bottle. So here goes. Cha. Okay, yeah, it, it's a spitter. <laughs> it, oof. I waited almost two years to review this perfume because um, it's really hard. This one, uh, let me lock it again so I don't lose any more lick. Oh my God. This one just moves me to tears. Yeah. All right. Composure. Listen. Almond blossom in the top notes. Heavy almond blossoms. Green notes and orange. Middle notes. Neroli, jasmine, ilang ilang, and the infamous tuberose. Base notes, sandalwood, vanilla, vetiver. So we have the Gerlinade base with sandalwood that echoes samsara in a way, in a different way. But the ilang ilang, the almond, the almond blossom, the tuberose. It's a bitter almondy tuberose, oily, arid, and yet drenched in something that is so sophisticated. It's like an essence of life. I got goosebumps all over my body. Like this, this thing is, um, so you have to envision there's dirt, dust. The sandalwood is a dry, arid sandalwood. The, the tuberose has blossomed, but it's just about to become putrid. It's overripe. The ilang ilang is smothering it. It's buttery to the point of nausea. It's bitter, but it's sharp. It's so precise and defined. The, the gerlinade in this, I think, has reached its summit. It's like the ultimate limit. It's the Olympus of, of the gerlinade. It's like Mr. Gerlin himself in his very advanced age, delivered one of his last creations, aware of the fact that life is coming to an end. And may, consciously or subconsciously, doesn't matter, but he delivered the ultimate Guerlain perfume, for better or for worse, way ahead of its time. The problem with this perfume, why it was not successful, in my humble opinion, was because it's still very rooted in the past. We have very clear streaks pulling towards the 60s and the 70s and even further back. So you can imagine for the two, year 2000, where all fashion brands and, and perfume houses were aiming towards the future. Everybody was obsessed with the beginning of the 2000s, with the zero, zero. You remember also the, the scandal. People were scared that computers were going to all crash once the year turned to 2000 because people were thinking computers are not going to be able to realize what year it is anymore. They're going to start counting from zero again. 
And everybody was projected towards the future. Everybody was doing these very futuristic, future projected looks and vibes, minimalism. The Y2K era was about to begin. Chanel launches Coco Mademoiselle, Chance, sweet chulies were in the air. And yet, Guerlain goes into the past of its own heritage. But then even further, it's like Mr. Guerlain jumped hundreds of years, eons into the past before men existed, before mankind existed, and, and landed into this, this, this arid place where there's nothing, there's literally no life. It's like he time-traveled so far back to reset the clock and plant a seed to re-envision humanity in the future. Kind of like a tabula rasa. That's what this perfume is. It's a clean slate to begin again. Now, it is so rooted in the past, though, that a lot of the people in the 2000s missed the point of this perfume because by its mere nature of wanting to reset time and maybe, hopefully, thinking that maybe humanity might do better the second time around, by creating a fragrance with such a concept this perfume is actually projected into the future as well. So it is a 2000s vision, after all. But just too much in the future. Because it's, it, it envisions a brand new version of humanity that started all over again. Hundreds of thousands of years in the, in the past and then delivered a parallel universe into the future. So this perfume has this unfortunate kind of nature to it, that it is, that it was too old school for the year 2000, but at the same time, it was way ahead of its time for the year 2000 and for the perfume trends in the year 2000. So that's the crux. That's the crux of this fragrance. That's the predicament we have here are we too dated or are we too ahead of our time? Today, as I review this fragrance, 24 years after its release, and my bottle is one of the first batches produced, so this bottle is 24 years old. Today, this fragrance still, still, it's way too ahead of its time. We, in this universe, in this reality, as humanity, as mankind, we have not reached this level of evolution yet. We have not. But in that parallel world that Guerlain envisioned for us, humanity has reached this state. This is literally a gateway to that parallel universe that fourth dimension, if you may. And it sends you to that parallel place where there is no life. And yet a seed was planted from the future, from another reality, transported through a liminal space, perhaps. And this, you can't really say nature can be a liminal space. And yet... Can it, though? After all, this landscape was produced by artificial intelligence. So technically, in my book, this is a liminal space. And that's where we travel to plant this seed. Coincidentally, and also on purpose, I chose to generate this particular type of landscape because if we go to analyze the ad campaign for Maura from the year 2000, what do we see? We also see the desert, arid desert with no life in it. And then all of a sudden we see 
we notice these little sticks coming out from the ground. These little, are they branches? Have humans planted them there? Is this some form of temple from archaic times? Is it some sort of primitive form of first tentative steps towards creating a belief system? Or is it just a way of maybe trying to understand life and death and the ending of something and trying to cope with the fact that something is coming to an end and trying to find reason within the end of something? The model of the art campaign for Maura appears bare. She does not have anything on. Uh, now, she does have the aesthetics of the early 2000s, you know, in terms of makeup and the styling. But there is all of a sudden life in this desert. Now, then we see kind of sort, sort of leaves or plants grow in, in this desert. It's basically the concept of you spray this perfume and it brings life no matter where you are, no matter what the situation is you're in, no matter how desolate, no matter how hopeless the place is, you are bringing life into it. What is fascinating, the art piece that is this bottle. Now, you know, it can have many different meanings. It can be like the sun, you see the, the round bubble here, it can be the sun. It, it can have, it almost have it has an ancient Egyptian quality to it. It's very, very ancestral and archaic in a way. It can also look like uh, a spaceship. You know, it's flying around. But it is a seed that is planted. And now, and that grows in this arid desert. And if you really spend time with this perfume, um, you realize it's pain. Now, I, oftentimes when I review Guerlain fragrances, especially the ones from the past, uh, they have um, a certain, let's call it a quality to them, but the, but the quality is um, almost a depression. Like a, there's a dis depressive vibe. There's a depressive type of uh, contemplation of life, existentialism. There's a burden in some of those fragrances, in L'Or Bleu, for example, but also in Après Londé or uh, Vol de Nuit. Even Liu has a certain heft to it that is kind of very much... It has a tendency of bringing you down, especially the opening notes of their fragrances. Now, this one is the ultimate example because the Guerlinade, which also is guilty for creating that certain nostalgia, sadness, melancholy, uh, it's brought to its highest peak here. While it's also been done dirty a little bit because we got that almondy top note. And the almond, even though it's in the top note, the almond blossom, that bitter accord keeps trickling down throughout all of the other you know, notes of the fragrance all the way to the base, to the heart, to the heart and to the base note. And you have that bitter almond all the way in the dry down when the Guerlinade completely kicks in. Through the Ilang Ilang, it maintains a buttery, ambrosial consistency, becomes almost like a brown, as if there were labdanum in here. It's like labdanum mass if you if you have ever seen it pure it's almost it's a resin kind of you know um caught on the beards of goats um and but uh without the labdanum but envision that consistency that's the type the smell smells like a certain type of consistency in that brown burgundy color way like this this is the color hue it's kind of a brown reddish color hue with um with that vanilla Guerlinade brought to exorbitant extremes, but then not sickly sweet because it's it's been reined back in by the almonds. So there's a, there's a but it but it is buttery because of the ylang ylang, very very buttery. But 
that bitter accord is what makes this entire potion overly ripe. It's as if now that Guerlain went to the past, parallel universe, planted the seed for humanity, we, for some weird reason, glitch in the matrix, if you may, got a hold of this bottle in our reality. And strangely enough, it feels like it's out of place. It's not supposed to exist in this reality. It, it exists in that other reality. So it's fading. In a way, it's, it's reached its, its peak already in, in another place. So in our world, it, it's almost rotting. It's almost overtly ripe, overtly mature. It basically smells as if it contains all the information you need with the love and the hate, with the, with the pain and the pleasure, you know, with, with loss and sorrow and gain and victories. It's like the whole history of a lifetime or of humanity is condensed in, a, in this bottle. So it is way too complex to decipher. And because it tells so many different stories, so the best place to begin is here, where maybe eons ago there used to be civilization and water and, and, and gorgeous growth and prosperity, but now th there's nothing left. Or maybe there never was anything and something is just about to begin as we see the cloud formation coming along and maybe it's going to start finally raining and maybe this arid, dry, void of life place will all of a sudden start compacting, forming itself and brewing with life. We are right in between in that liminal space where everything already happened, but we don't know exactly what happened, and yet nothing appears to be alive in front of our eyes. And then we also have a very simple concept of a perfumer reaching a very advanced age, acknowledging the end of life, kind of walking towards that sunset, slowly reminiscing about all the beautiful and also sad things that happen in their life as they're walking towards that sunset. Whether consciously or subconsciously, this is a poem about saying goodbye to life. It is, uh, I don't want to say it's welcoming death, but it is definitely welcoming whatever comes next. And it is also kind of like in ancient Egyptian times, like a, the sun god being worshipped in this pod, a seed that's planted that would grow. And from the seed, the life essence juice is formed. And this life essence and juice is going to spread more seeds. And those seeds are going to grow again. In other words... It's kind of like a modern day, but ancient Egyptian burial site where a pharaoh would be buried or people who could afford to plan ahead in, during their lifetime for their death in order to gain eternal life. It's almost like encapsulating in a smell and in a bottle this desire to live forever, whilst being very well aware of the fact that the body is not going to keep moving forever, just like the ancient Egyptians would mummify the body after it passed away, and then the body would transform, it would have a different shape, it wouldn't be moving anymore, but yet the ancient Egyptians considered that that body, if it was embalmed properly, the mummies were embalmed properly, were covered properly, they were buried in a tomb with all the correct products that allowed the soul and the spirit of that defunct, deceased person to meet the gods and live on forever. Meaning, food 
is being prepared and buried together in the burial chamber so that the person might eat themselves but also offer the food to the gods. Gold, jewelry, special talismans and trinkets and special objects were buried with a with the deceased to, in order for them to be able to utilize them in the afterlife with all the different gods that they were going to encounter, just to pass all the different tests that their soul needed to pass in order to become immortal. It's almost as if a commentary on that type of burial and idea of death afterlife was encapsulated in this bottle. It's almost as if we have the concept of passing away to enter eternal life on the other side. That's the story that Maura tells me. It is a very, very ancient story. The ancient Egyptians did not believe that after the moving body is no longer moving, oh, well, it's over, you're dead. They were not obsessed with youth culture. But rather, they would spend their entire lives projecting and working towards preparing themselves for the afterlife. So for them, the afterlife was not a taboo. It was nothing scary. It was a beautiful celebration. It was entering into a brand new state of being, an eternal state of being. For a mere mortal, it is really difficult dare I say, impossible to grasp the concept of immortality because we are mortal by definition. And yet, somehow, somehow, right before it drives us completely crazy, we manage to catch a glimpse of that immortality. Some people manage to capture it through a sunset. Some manage to capture it through a poem they write, some through music they hear or music that they compose, some through love, through sex. But some, very rarely though, manage to capture the smell of that eternity. And I'm not talking about the Calvin Klein perfume, eternity, that's a different type of eternity. But eternal life, after you've been mummified, right? The ancient ways of believing in the afterlife. That's what's encapsulated here. This fragrance tells an ancient story. And it is a story that not many can decipher and understand. It's almost as if you were confronted with hieroglyphics all of a sudden. And you have no means of translating them into your own language. Now this is an emotional language, so you need to have a certain type of emotional intelligence to tap into what this perfume is actually telling you. But once you've tapped into it and you fall down into that endless vast space that it offers you as a landscape on which to build your own belief system upon, which is this arid, endless desert, that's when the story really begins. Because you smell what it means for this person who created the perfume what it means to them to come to terms with their body being close to the end, but their soul wanting, desiring, believing that it will live on forever. So we have it's such a complex perfume because, like I said, it's traveling back in time to reinvent humanity, trying to, you know, to live life again one more time to fix whatever they did wrong. But at the same time, it's also projecting through the history books and all the knowledge that we've gained about our past civilizations that really did exist. But it's also projecting towards the future because it's giving us a vision of this particular person's wish to live forever. But it is also connecting every ingredient 
to a specific facet of these desires. The tuberose for the sexuality. The tuberose is at the heart of this perfume. In fact, the tuberose is what elevates this to an almost viscerally sexual experience because, as we know from the history of tuberose, it's kind of a night-blooming plant and uh, it has this way of slithering for miles and miles and miles through the air till it kind of creeps into your nose when it's blooming and it's intoxicating, tantalizing. It does not stop calling your name. It wakes you up. It wakes all your senses up. It was forbidden for young virgins to pass by a blooming tuberose because it was believed that they would lose their virginity immediately to the intoxicating powers, inebriating powers of this highly sexual plant. This plant, this flower, is at the heart of Maura. It's the beating pulse, together with the bitter gerlinade. And it keeps pecking at you, almost ticking as if it were a clock. And now we're catapulted in those visions of Salvador Dali and Mr. Guerlain maybe even knew Salvador Dali and met him personally and envision all of a sudden in this landscape those classic surrealistic Salvador Dali paintings of melting clocks, elephants on huge skinny legs passing through the landscape. This kind of reality which is conditioned by maybe, you know, substance abuse that kind of delivers that vibe and feeling, but also transcends into something completely different, a different reality in which everything is possible. Really, everything is possible. The language that we speak is no longer a language constructed through words, but it is rather a language constructed through emotions. Now, I'm having a really hard time translating emotions for this particular review into words. In fact, it took me two years of marinating on top of Maura to finally feel ready to review it, to be able to kind of put into words the poetry that this perfume delivers and the sadness that it delivers because it is a perfume that smells of the end of something, but it is also a perfume that smells of eternity. But the sadness there, you see, is that while we are alive, while we do not have any certainties about afterlife, we can only have faith and hope. No actual scientific facts to prove any of this is real or possible. All we have is our hope, our faith, our dreams. So, and a lot of us are skeptical. A lot of us don't believe in what we cannot see. A lot of us don't believe what cannot be proven physically and scientifically, biologically. So when confronted with a perfume like this, you smell it. And if you are that skeptical person, that skeptic, you're going to be, hmm, mm, this perfume is not for me because this perfume requires faith. I'm not talking about any specific religions here, okay? Calm down. Faith, personal faith, spirituality, spirituality of your own kind, whatever it may be. But you need to have it in order to hear what this perfume has to say. Otherwise, it will just be an overtly ripe, almost rotting flower, drenched in old butter with a very bitter almond accord poisoning the vanilla gerlinade. And this is what's so heartbreaking to me. What brings me to tears with this fragrance is that you, I had to spend a lot of time to unlock it for myself because I was that skeptic person. When I first smelled it, I was repulsed by it almost disgusted. So you can either just see the rotting flesh 
of decay. Or within it, you can see the seed of life, planted, ready to bloom, to grow, to, to shed those roots. And a whole new universe is born out of it. That's what's so heartbreaking to me, the duality of this fragrance, that, that it, it's kind of, it knows that after you're gone, you're gone, but it hopes, it keeps hoping that, well, just maybe, once your time has come, maybe it's not over. Maybe there's something more on the other side. Let's create a smell that smells of that eternal hope for whatever's next. So it's a perfume that smells of what's next with, in its kind of anti-chamber or four-chamber, the skepticism, that the bitterness of rea realization that there is nothing after. After we're gone, we're gone, baby. It's over. Game over. So it's up to you. It's really up to you. And that's the beauty of this perfume. That's how textured and layered and deep it is. It's up to you to either smell the disgusting decay and the rotting flesh and the overtly ripe flowers and fruits in here. Or you could smell the hope, the energy, the eternal life. The duality is what makes Maura so incredible. Whether it was a conscious or a subconscious decision, I do believe when a person comes to a certain age and they have lived so much and experienced so much, they are ready for this sort of poetry to deliver this sort of poetry. And deliver, Mr. Guerlain did. For me at this point, the, the rotting aspect and the hopeful aspect merge together because I've been to both sides with this perfume. That's why it took me two years to deliver a, a review. Two years of researching it, sniffing it, smelling it over and over and over again analyzing the bottle, the tactile experience of this bottle, touching the bottle, feeling it, the, the, the twist spray, what this seed means, what the bud means. The actual bottle came in a green box, green, yellowish green, like leaves, like life. But then when you pull it out, you get this arid desert color and gold reflection of the sun. Look at that. And interesting, a leaflet came with this box and uh, almost like a little tiny pamphlet very fascinating unfortunately since you know so many years have passed 22 years since I unboxed it but now 24 years since its release and I did buy a dead stock so this one was brand new never uh, unboxed and inside is a leaflet that describes a little bit hints at the mystery of Maura and says, to find out more, I'm paraphrasing here, to find out more about this mysterious fragrance, Maura, write us to this address and we will send you more information. Now, obviously, I've been asking all the people I, I know in the perfume world, if somebody has connections to Guerlain, nobody delivered. I really wanted somebody to tell me, what did Guerlain send people? that actually wrote a letter to them, sending them the little piece of paper that says, for more information about Maura and its myth, send this cou coupon. Like, you know what I mean? It was almost like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. It was a weird, it was like, you want a ticket. I mean, every box had one of those. But literally, Guerlain was telling you, I know that they probably just wanted to collect customer information, but they said, like, write us about this perfume and we will send you more information. That got me very intrigued and I really, really wanted to know what it was that people got sent 
back in the year 2000 that actually wrote to Guerlain asking more information about Maura. I could not find anybody um, who actually did that and who actually received more information, nor could my contacts manage to go into the Guerlain archives to figure out what that information and material was. Was it a printed book? Was it a poster? Was it just one sheet of paper with some more information? Was it a photograph? But it just adds even more to the mystery and to the allure of this perfume, to be you know, perfectly frank with you. The fact that kind of this mythology is going lost, that this perfume has this extra added level of mystery now since it's no longer in production. So first of all, it's no longer in production. So you can't even get the perfume anymore unless you don't buy it pre-loved. But then that little paper inside of that box really inspired me even more to, to kind of want to know more about the mysteries of this perfume. The fascinating thing about the box is also that it has a hole in the front. So the box is all a beautiful kind of metallic green leaves and it says Guerlain, Maura, and then there's a hole right around this little nipple thing here so that the bottle is standing in the box and you can see through the box, you can see this circle, you can see the sun, basically, this kind of idealized sun with a hammered metal on the bottle. And yes, this is metal here. It's that classic hammered Guerlain, Byzance style metal and then it has these little X's as if it were kind of stitched onto the bottle. Those same X's are on top here, reflected, sewing together the pod, which is the seed. And then in the back, we also had the hammered metal and then we have Maura hidden. See the name is hidden behind the bottle, inside of the perfume almost. It looks as if Maura, the name of the fragrance was kind of inside of the the bottle, it's not, it's just on the back of the metal plate, but the effect, the illusion it gives us is of it being inside. And it's very, very Egyptian, in my opinion. Ancient Egypt style, mysterious. And then you also can analyze the bottle as if this was a seed and this was a seed. It's like two seeds merging together, or is this a root? It can be so many different things. It all depends how you interpret it. It's rounded off in the back. You can see how it has that slight roundness. And then in the front, it's a more flat surface with the bump. But so there is so much attention to detail. I think that even this bottle was way ahead of its time. I mean, it's very reminiscent of the 60s and 70s as well, even though it came out in the 2000s. But that's because also the artist who designed the bottle was more advanced in age and already had you know, more inspiration from that era than from the actual year 2000. So this, this is another element where we can kind of observe a bottle like this and think, oh, it's a little bit out of touch with the times. I just think it's, like I said, again, way ahead of its time, even the bottle design, as well as anchoring itself thousands of years back into history of humanity. So on every aspect, on every level of this perfume, you have to use your imagination and you have to use your emotional intelligence to really go there. Whether you see or smell the rotting decay in this perfume or whether you smell hope and eternal life. They both smell the same. It's all just about how you interpret it. It's all up to you. It's all in your hands. This arid desert can remain arid, but also there can be incredible life in here. It's all up to you. And that's ultimately what I think Mahora's message is. Thank you for watching this review. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, thumb it up. Let me know if you have any information about Mahora, <laughs> you know, like the leaflet, what happens if you write them to Guerlain back in the day, if you wrote them, did you get anything back? Do you have Mahora or not? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Either way, let me know down below. Love you loads. Take care. 
Thumb up this video if you've enjoyed it. Never forget to never give up on love. Bye.